Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar on overcoming trade funding barriers with Bibi Financial Services. My name is William barnes Graham, and I'm the Senior Content Editor at the Institute of Exports and International Trade. Open to Export is a free online service helping small businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, our export action plan tool, and our quarterly competitions. You can find out about all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for traders, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, so you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. Today we are joined by Yvonne Rudolph anderson the Export Head of Operations at BB Financial Services, who are, I'm sure do a much better job introducing herself than I will. So over to you, Yvonne. Thanks very much, Will. Uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to our presentation on how to come overcome common funding barriers for exporters. Next slide. I'll have a quick run through who Bibi Financial Services are, talk about what our research tells us about both UK exporters and UK exports, what the common barriers are to overcoming um, issues with exporting, what to research, how to work with your financier. We'll end up looking at a couple of case studies and as Will mentioned, be pleased to take any questions at the end of the presentation. Next. So Bibi Financial Services are a leading independent finance provider. Very importantly from, from this slide, you will see that we have 40 offices in 14 countries around the world. They provide support uh, and a valued service to our exporting clients in terms of managing time zone issues and language barriers. And I will talk about that some more later on. Bibi Financial Services have been involved in export finance for uh, the past 15 years and have a team of exports um, working with exporters more or less around the clock, if we include our offices around the world um, to grow UCO export. Next. And this is who we are. I've been with Bibi for four years. And on this slide, you can see my colleagues in the specialist products division of Bibi uh, Financial Services. We have construction finance, export finance that we're talking about today, trade finance, recruitment, and extremely important for our exporting clients, an FX business that provides spot and forward contracts to actually both existing BFS clients and to non-clients that, that, that have such a need. Uh, next slide. I think that um, there may be some perhaps on the, on the um, presentation that aren't aware of uh, what invoice finance is and how it works. And this is how we fund our clients overseas trade. So the client invoices the debtor for goods sold and sends us a copy of the invoice when risk transfers according to the INCO term. Typically, we would provide up to 90% of the value of the invoice immediately. That will have some dependency on the markets the exporter is selling to, if they are what we might consider higher risk markets where economic or political risk might be involved, then sometimes it would be lower than 90%. The invoice financier, whether it's BFS or any other invoice finance business that you choose from the, from the um, high street, um, chase the payment of the invoice when it matures. The client can also opt to chase for payment themselves. 
uh, if they already have a robust credit control procedure in place, we don't want to take that away from them. The debtor will pay the invoice to the invoice financier either directly or into a trust account. If it's an undisclosed uh, facility where maybe the customer is not aware that an invoice financier is involved, they will pay, pay into account in the client's name. However, it is a trust account that's managed by the invoice financier. And once the money is received, the client will receive the remaining 10% less any fees. Uh, I think that you'll find whoever you speak to that that's quite common for invoice finance. What do Bibi Financial Services offer? Well, we'll give funding up to 10 million pounds. Um, we'll give 100% export ledger funding. High involvement and single debtor relationship funding. High involvement is where there's a lack of spread of customers to manage the risk. So if you have a single customer and they fail, it makes it very difficult to get the money back. Therefore, usually something called high involvement tends to kick in. But if you take bad debt protection, which may be better known to you as trade credit insurance, we can remove the um, issues of high involvement. And I believe that we're one of the few funders on the, on the high street that does this. Obviously, we're now giving you speed. You're getting your invoices paid faster. We're giving you your money the day after you assign the invoices to us, which will allow you the opportunity to earn discounts from your suppliers. Confidentiality or an undisclosed facility keeps the facility discreet, and we seek invoice payment on behalf of your company. We fund as many worldwide territories as we possibly can. Uh, obviously, there will be EU and UN sanctioned countries that we tend not to get involved with. But other than that, although there will be some high risk countries that, that we might have to turn down, we make every effort to fund wherever we can. We provide language and time zone support, both through our offices in the 14 countries around the world. And we also have over 21 language speakers in our office in Banbury, which is where our head office is. We provide security through bad debt protection. Next slide. We do a lot of research with exporters, uh, both our clients and exporters in general. And the information that you see on this slide is what uh, we've been able to, to gauge from latest surveys. So the top three export destinations, USA, Germany, and France. If we extend that to the top five, that would probably also include Ireland and the Netherlands. And that those top five, particularly two, three, four, and five, tend to change places quite regularly. 50% of uh, the top 20 export destinations are within the EU. However, uh, we are seeing more interest in North Africa, in South America, and Southeast Asia, particularly for technical manpower in the oil and gas industry. One of the biggest issues that our exporters tell us they have the most problems with is foreign exchange. Uh, more than two thirds of those with an FX requirement have adversely been impacted by currency volatility in the past year. And in fact, on average, 69,000 pounds worth of money that's come off the bottom line, basically, in the past 12 months, where those, where those SMEs have been impacted. That's a big, that's a big chunk out of a, a bottom line margin. And almost a quarter of those SMEs say that they have never reviewed their FX requirements. And this is why it's so important that Bibi is able to offer an FX facility, as I mentioned, both to clients and to businesses that are not clients of Bibi. However, for those clients that we have, if they take up the facility, like the high street banks, we do not ask for a deposit in advance. So the top three challenges you won't be surprised to see. Number one is managing currency fluctuations, followed by logistics, 
if you're shipping goods from Birmingham to London, it's a completely different ballpark when you're shipping from the UK to Singapore, where the goods might be on the water for a couple of weeks. They'll be different. There'll be new paperwork involved, bills of lading, certificates of origin, certificates of insurance, um, general customs paperwork that perhaps new exporters will not be um, familiar with. Similarly, when we look at our importers um, who come to us for our trade finance facilities, again, it's managing currency fluctuations. It's about the VAT and the freight payments that they have to make up front, and again, logistics. It would be very difficult, I think, to run this presentation without mentioning Brexit at all. We do believe that our own clients are starting to look at uh, the impacts of Brexit more closely, at customs tariffs, and how this might affect their businesses after we leave the EU. Many of our clients tell us they're not expanding exports just now. They want to wait and see, uh, as they consider that the, the waters remain quite muddied in this area. Next slide. So further uh, information regarding our research. Uh, I'd like to come down to sales expectations. That's quite interesting. Uh, a decline in sales perhaps for, for Hong Kong but increases for Singapore and Canada, for example, where we're seeing uh, a demand for funding projects in these markets more and more. And you'll notice then we've got the EU, Netherlands, Germany, the Czech Republic, and so on. And I mentioned in the previous slide that many of our exporters are telling us they're in a bit of a wait and see at the moment, that they're not expanding their exports. But when you actually look at these statistics, it might suggest otherwise. Now, whether that's um, evidence of a mixed bag between pro and anti Brexiteers, I think we'll have to say that only time will tell. Uh, the other um, graph on here I'd bring attention to is the average payment times. So, interestingly, a market such as Singapore takes quite a while uh, to affect payment, whereas the USA where you also have maybe goods on the water for two or three weeks, are quite quick in making payment. So we see this as a mix of local culture environment on payments um, versus shipping times. If you look at France, where certainly it doesn't take so long to get the goods um, delivered, historically for some years now, we've seen France uh, with average payment days above several markets, particularly within the EU. And we always take a rule of thumb and say perhaps anything north of the Loire Valley is paying um, much more quickly than anything south of the Loire Valley. Uh, next slide, please. So there is a link to our research. We have several reports, a Trading Faces report and a quarterly SME confidence tracker. These can be downloaded quite free of charge from our uh, website. And I know, I think that Will will be um, telling you that you can have a copy of this presentation uh, after we finish today. So don't worry about making a note of the um, email of the web address now. You can pick it up later on. Next slide, please. This is what our clients tell us they identify with and which contribute to the costs involved in exporting. Why do businesses export? Well, for expansion, if the local market is stagnating. For profitability, because invariably you can charge more in export than you can in the domestic market. We see clients with a planned strategy, businesses that have been looking into markets, how they're going to uh, get into certain areas and regions that they may have picked out, Maybe it takes six or nine months before they actually start to export, but they believe that they've got all their ducks in a row before they start. But we also have many clients with, that had no export strategy, but they have an unexpected export order. Maybe they were at a trade fair and the next day an order comes in and the client doesn't know what to do with it, except that they're very happy to take the order and maybe don't always think about what may be involved in, in exporting goods. And this is where the expertise of organizations such as Open to Export and the Institute of Export 
where we're always guiding our clients to uh, refer uh, can come in uh, much use, I would say. Next slide, please. So what we uh, wanted to, to concentrate on today was, was funding. And obviously there are other opportunities other than invoice finance in the marketplace. Letters of credit, um, now these are a secure payment method if the terms of the LC are fully met, but they're also quite expensive and your bank may reserve value of the LC from your overdraft or funding agreement with them. Forfeiting, usually for single contracts and larger transactions, terms up to 180 days and uh, a method of payment that we don't come across too often in the invoice finance arena. And we have invoice finance, of course, which is the funding of your short-term receivables with credit terms usually up to 120 days. Invoice discounting is also something that the invoice financier will offer. It's a bulk upload of invoices rather than an invoice by invoice upload. But again, it gives immediate cash and terms of payment up to 120 days. So several op options to think about. Next slide, please. I want to talk about some of the things that can impact on funding and when you can get uh, funding made available to you. And if we look at this slide, I'm actually going to draw your attention to the last item actually here on the, on the bottom right hand corner, which law shall govern the contract. Uh, this is really important for us and generally for financiers and is something that many of our exporters don't think about at the front end. If you're only trading with customers who want you to adhere to their overarching contract or their terms and conditions of purchase, then you will be trading probably under the local law of your customer. And that means if anything goes wrong, if there's a dispute, if you had to go to arbitration or you had to go to court, it may well be that you have to go to that market um, to carry out that, that litigation or, or that arbitration. So if you think about maybe having to go to markets, the United Arab Emirates, maybe to South uh, America, where to go to court, you would probably need to have a state authorized translator to translate all of your documentation. Somebody with you in court uh, to translate to what you say into the local language, even if they can speak English. And you'll have to stay probably in a hotel for a week, a couple of weeks, and these are all costs that often exporters just don't think about because of course you shouldn't go into exporting with a glass half empty and think that all your sales are gonna turn into disputes. But if you have customers who want you to adhere to their terms and conditions and their contracts, you do have to think about the um, wider implications. An exporter should always have his own terms and conditions of sale and they should be suitable for exporting so they should include things like INCO terms and uh, elongated payment terms uh, and, and how disputes will be managed and ideally always mention that it would be under the um, legal jurisdiction of Wales and, and England. But there are, other, um, there are other things to think about. If you have your own um, contract, uh, what to put in there and we find that the Institute of Export and Open to Export are very good at supporting um, businesses and what they should have in their terms and conditions. I know that the uh, Institute of Export have recently announced a, a new type of membership where they can support exporters with the correct terms and conditions of sale. Just one other thing that's important that the funder will look at and that will be ban on assignment which means uh, if you're working to your customers' terms and conditions, they will be advising you that you cannot assign your invoices to a third party, such as an invoice financier. It invariably will go on to say that they're happy to accept this, uh, providing you seek their permission. And most invoice financiers will have a ban on assignment waiver letter to provide to you to overcome that particular issue. Um, right of set off is something else that can be um, quite troublesome if you think you're going to get paid fully for it for an invoice and suddenly only half the amount of money comes in 
because they discovered something they didn't like um, on a previous invoice that they'd paid in full, and therefore they're going to take that off the next invoice they pay you. Quite often, if stage payments or milestones are involved, the financier will ask for a divisibility clause, which means that the customer cannot deduct um, disputes or quality um, values from future invoices. Next slide, please. When you approach an invoice financier, they will have a certain set of rules, um, an assessment guide that they will look at. They will look at the um, experience of the um, company that's coming to them, whether they're motivated, what their company values are, perhaps what the threats and opportunities are of the product or service that's being provided. And they will also usually speak, seek some security, um, probably in the term of a personal guarantee of the major shareholder. They look very closely at the debt, the values involved, are the debts assignable? Uh, is there anything in the contracts, as I just mentioned previously, that, that might make them um, not uh, eligible for invoice finance? Are they contractually complete and collectible? Uh, we look at dilution levels, and that's to say we look at maybe how many credit notes have been raised in the last 12 months. Are there credit notes for disputes that might suggest there are quality problems? Or are they credit notes for admin mistakes? If it's poor admin, it's something that we can support the exporter in and ideally help them to overcome uh, with better ideas and solutions. And importantly, we'll look at the financials, whether a business is solvent or profitable and how the business performs in key areas. But I would say that having said all of that, um, companies like uh, Bibi Financial Services, do take on loss-making businesses um, if projections clearly support future profitability and a turnaround in the business. We take on new starts that have no financial history. Um, maybe we take higher personal security in those kind of situations. But certainly, um, if there are any businesses that are listening today that perhaps are not having the best of times, um, don't think that you're not suitable for invoice finance because wherever we can, we always try and find a way. It's about creating a mutually beneficial relationship. Next slide, please. Inco terms also impact on funding where invoice finance is involved particularly. If we look at the chart here, first of all, I would just mention that XWorks is not an export Inco term. Although I know there are lots of exporters that do use that expression, it's free carrier. Uh, X works where the goods are collected at the seller's factory gate, you can do the same with free carrier. And it's where risk transfers, which may well be in this case at the factory gate, that um, our clients are able to assign their invoices and we can provide the funding. So we accept invoices and fund where risk transfers. So if you go to the bottom of this chart and you look at DDP, where the goods are being delivered, uh, maybe to uh, the customer's warehouse in uh, the named destination, or even to the front door of your customer. If that's going by sea and it's far away and it's taking three weeks before we can get evidence of risk of transfer, then obviously that's a longer three weeks before we can provide funding on an invoice. Uh, next slide, please. Research is key. If you don't have a checklist and you're new to exporting, please get one. I know that the IOE uh, uh, open to export do a very good checklist and that's certainly worth uh, looking for on their, on their website. Uh, next. Thank you. So, what do you want from your invoice financier or your bank? This is the kind of support you should be looking out for. You want 100% export ledger funding. You don't want your financier to be saying, well, I'm not so clean on overseas markets, so 
I'll give you some funding against your domestic debt, but maybe only 30% of your export ledger. Uh, maybe they don't like single customer relationships. Do they have expert specialist services in-house to support? Is there foreign exchange management? There certainly should be. <clears throat> and how many territories worldwide will they fund? I'd mentioned earlier in the presentation that at BFS, we pride ourselves on trying to fund as many, many uh, territories as absolutely possible. Language and time zone support. So if you're working with an invoice financier that has offices around the world, um, then they can support the language barriers and the issues with time zones. And security through bad debt protection. If you're dealing with higher risk markets, maybe markets in Africa, certain parts of South America, you'll want some kind of credit protection, not just for protracted default, but also for economic and political risk, which all the major trade um, credit organizations will provide to you today, and something that Bibi Financial Services also support. Next slide, please. I mentioned uh, case studies at the beginning. Uh, woven it was started by a young lady who saw that there was a gap in the market for speciality denim wear. She needed funding to grow. When she came to us, the business was in fact still quite new, um, but we were able to provide 500,000 pounds worth of working capital funding to support her international expansion. Selling predominantly in Europe and North America. Uh, North America, a difficult market sometimes to get into because each state is so large. Where do you start? Do you start in uh, the West Coast, the East Coast? Do you need an agent? Uh, many things to consider, but uh, this young lady had um, conquered North America quite successfully uh, with her um, design wear in denim. Next slide, please. Our, uh, we have a client, Silent Sentinel Limited. They manufacture surveillance and security systems all around the world. They have offices not only in the UK, but also in US, Singapore and Jordan. They needed to boost their working capital so that they could grow even larger and they could open offices in even more markets where security and surveillance systems um, were of high um, importance. Uh, Paul Elsie, the managing director, has been very pleased with the service that we've been able um, to provide. As he mentions here, the exporting doesn't come without its challenges. We needed a funder that could help us to overcome some of the complexities on credit terms and payment practices, both legal and language barriers. And through our expertise, um, I'm pleased to say that very successfully we've been able to support Paul in his business. Next slide. Thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen to me um, today. I hope it's been insightful, even if in just some small way. And if you have any questions, I will, I think, now hand you back to Will at the um, Open to Export. Many thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, some really great advice and tips there as ever, and I hope everyone has found that useful. As Yvonne has said, we're now going to open the floor for questions, so please do ask questions using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, the first question I've got is from a Czech company, and they've asked, um, is Bibi solely a UK, uh, working with UK companies, or is it, does it have an international element to it as well? Do you have international well, SMEs too? Yeah, the, the the 40 offices in the 14 countries is our international element. In the UK, we only take UK clients. Um, in, in, in our overseas markets, we only take on clients that are in those markets. So if there is a company in the Czech Republic, they would go to Bibi in the Czech Republic and they would have um, a relationship with them. Quite often, uh, businesses come to us they have subsidiaries or businesses, for example, in the USA. Um, I picked the USA because quite recently we took on board a client. We funded the UK business 
and our colleagues in Atlanta, Georgia, funded the uh, US element of that deal. So we can work together with our overseas uh, offices to fund um, mutual clients. Great, great stuff. And um, I've had a couple of questions from some of the particularly smaller companies, and I think it's kind of will pick up on one of the points you made. And it's asking kind of how they can demonstrate um, when they don't have much of a history as a company, how they can demonstrate to you that they are um, kind of credit worthy and, and worth uh, your while, kind of your support. Um, yeah, what advice do you have for particularly small companies in that case? Okay, well, for, for small or perhaps new stuff, Smart uh, businesses, uh, we would probably expect to see that they've put some money into that business themselves to get to get started, and that's that's a big commitment in itself. Um, we'd hope that they would maybe have, if not um, cash flow forecasts, that they would at least have something that can demonstrate that they've been out into whichever market they've chosen, and that they've got orders on the books, or they're in discussions with businesses that have made a firm commitment for orders. So once we know that the business um, has got a, a future, then we're happy to try and find a solution. So it's a question of bringing to us what maybe what you might be taking to your bank um, to get a business overdraft. So some um, in inclination of what business you're going to do over the next 12 months or the next six months, how you're going to achieve that business how you're going to market, you know, the route to market is really important, whether they're using an agent, whether they're traveling themselves, doing it through the internet. So as long as we can see that there's a viable business um, that's, that's being presented to us, then, then we will find a way to fund it. And how important then is a... Um... How important then is a, a plan, a kind of a business plan, which um, a business can take to you business, and show? Business plans, business plans are very important, really important. And I know that um, Open to Export help with business plans, that they have some templates on their website. And I think it's really important that uh, new starts and small businesses take advantage of what's available to them in the marketplace from organisations such, such as yourselves, Will. Um, and anything that they have that they bring to us that we can look at that demonstrates that there's a business there, then that's suitable. We don't, ex obviously, new spark starts don't have any financials because they haven't been trading or haven't been trading very long. Uh, and we appreciate that there's only one or two people in the business that maybe it's difficult to prepare a lot of statistical information. But we just need to see some basics. To understand that there is a there is a business there. Great, thanks, Yvonne. And uh, I think that the plan in uh, Yvonne was referencing there is the export action plan tool on Open Export, which is basically yeah. designed for, for that sort of purpose. Um, we've had a couple of questions in from people asking, what is the advantage of using a provider like yourself over a bank? Well, we grow with the customer's business. So the more turnover you have, the more invoices you raise, the more we should be able to advance funds to you because we advance funds against the receivable. If you have an overdraft with the bank, they usually put a cap on that. And therefore, when you reach that cap, um, you've got nowhere else to go. But we always try to be as flexible as possible. Uh, we can see when our clients are growing. We talk to them in advance. So we might have a client that would start off maybe with a, a funding line of, let's say, £100,000. But nine months down the line, they're getting new orders in, they're getting heard about in those marketplaces that they've targeted, uh, turnover's growing, and they now need 130 or 150 or maybe even £200,000. We have relationship managers that work with our clients that are talking to them regularly as soon as the client says, look, I've got a new order, I think I'm going to grow, I think the amount of money that you're lending to me is not sufficient, then we would re-look at the whole facility and we would endeavour to give um, those clients as much as we possibly could against their receivables so that they can meet their, their target growth potential. And I think that uh, that's a lot more flexible probably than what um, might be found from a high street bank overdraft, for example. 
Great, thank you. And um, we've had a question just in from Jenny, who's asked, how do uh, Bibi help companies manage their international financial transactions, i.e. paying in dollars or euros? Yeah, uh, we appreciate that if you're going to compete locally, you're probably going to have to invoice maybe in euros or US dollars, for example. So you can have a sterling account, you can have a US dollar account, you can have a euro account. You can invoice in those currencies and we will receive monies in, in those currencies. If you have a use, for example, for US dollars, let's say you're invoicing in US dollars and your supplier is charging you in US dollars. You can use those US dollars to pay your supplier. If you don't have a use for the US dollars, then maybe you take advantage of one of our spot or forward contracts through um, BBFX. Uh, we can um, convert currencies uh, into sterling at spot rate um, through BBFX, and we have some um, we have some very good good rates to offer as well. So that, yeah, we can, and we appreciate, obviously, that exporters have to deal in currencies other than sterling if they're um, serious about um, getting into local market, particularly there where there may be a lot of competition. Great, thank you. And um, just to remind everyone, you can ask questions using the control panel on the right-hand side. So um, if you've got a question, please do feel free to, to ask it. We've got a bit of time um, remaining. Um, an interesting question here in reference to your uh, research paper, the Trading Places paper, um, and it's asking particularly about what impact has Brexit had in terms of SMEs approach to exporting? Um, it's a bit of a, a loaded question, that one, but um, mm. in terms of the research I, Well, as I mentioned Brexit only briefly because it is a very, it's a difficult question to answer. And I think that when we speak to our clients, uh, some some of them are doing nothing. Some of them are burying their heads in the sand and waiting to see what happens, um, hoping that perhaps there'll be another referendum um, and that the, the, the um, final outcome will be that we have a deal with the EU. Others of our clients, maybe the larger of our SME clients, are seriously now looking at tariffs, how it's going to affect their business if they have to um, start paying tariffs, um, how that will affect the price of their goods or, or um, the service being provided. So there is definitely a lot more, I would say, interest and concern than there was six months ago. But we're still getting mixed messages from our clients. And I can't say that there is one particular issue or a nugget of advice that's coming from um, the information that our clients are giving us that, that that intimates to us that we're moving in it that exporters are moving in a certain way many are saying we're happy with the export business we've got but we're not going to go out to new markets we're not going to do any more until um, we see what happens yet as you could as you saw from the information most of the exporters think that there will be increase in turnover in markets such as I mentioned Singapore and Canada and we hope to get um, a deal with Canada yet also markets such as the Netherlands um, I think Czech Republic we will still see growth in those areas those those EU markets that we're so dependent on in the at the moment so as I said it's a mixed bag and I think it depends whether you're a pro or anti brexiteer to a certain extent as to how much you're actually involving yourself in, in getting prepared. That's a really good answer. Thank you. And um, just one last question, because the questions are drying up slightly. We've had a couple of people okay. ask uh, a couple of people ask about letters of credits and how they can work for small businesses. Um, obviously, this could be a webinar in its own right. I think we covered it earlier this year. Yeah, actually, I think but, it probably uh, could. Yeah. Um, invoice finance doesn't uh, lend itself to, to letters of credit. So I, I probably would start by saying that I'm not the absolute export expert, but what letters of credit do, because they're, they're secure, it's, a, it's an exchange of documents between banks, between the um, customer's bank and yours. So providing everything goes well, there should be a, a guarantee that you will get paid. But the documentation against the goods all has to be in order. And quite often that documentation can go wrong. 
And if it goes wrong and you have to uh, pay for amendments to be raised, they're expensive, they can be expensive. The High Street Bank will charge you for every amendment on every letter of credit that you have outstanding. And of course, if you're going into a new export market um, and you yourselves in, uh, are new to, um, to exporting, you know, many customers don't want to pay by letter of credit these days. I think it's quite acceptable in, in some markets still, such as China, for example, but if you're just going uh, over the water to begin with into Europe, you're not going to get very far if you're asking your customers to pay by letter of credit. They are expecting to receive open account terms. And if you have bad debt protection, um, and if you have your invoices and you have your shipping documentation and your orders all in order, then providing there isn't a dispute, bad debt protection, should um, protect you and enable you to compete locally in the marketplace by having open account terms. I think that letters of credit, especially for very small businesses, are um, extremely expensive and take up a lot of time as well. Great. Um, well, uh, wait, we might just have one last question. Um, one last question. Um, it's from Brian, uh, a long time listener actually. So. Um, what is the relationship between Bibi and UK Export Finance? Okay, um, Bibi are in very close communication with UK Export Finance. And in fact, um, we would hope that in the near future, we have a much more closer relationship with them than, than we do at the moment. There are not many independent invoice financiers that are approved, for example, for the Working Capital Scheme. It's something that we're looking at. It means that we'll be able to fund even more markets than we are at the moment. We know that UK export finance obviously work with the major banks, but when I talk to um, businesses, uh, quite often they're saying, well, our banks don't offer us anything from UK export finance because the banks, the branches in themselves, don't often know what UK export finance have to offer or even at their, their bank um, can provide um, funding against markets where the, the, there might be a guarantee against the working capital scheme, or that they can get a credit limit from the ECA where the commercial uh, underwriting market won't, won't provide cover. So uh, we know UK Export Finance very well. They have uh, uh, excellent products. And although we don't work so closely with them at the moment, we would hope that by the end of the year, um, you would see that, that, that that's about to change. Fantastic. And we've had one question in while, that, uh, while you're answering that one. It's from Joanne. It's a really good question. Um, it's in regards to markets with embargoes or political risks, upper political risks. Will you try to find markets or banks that will work with such markets, uh, Iran being an example, or will you just say you cannot help with those markets? So, which market did you say? Did you say a market? I didn't quite hear you. It was uh, Iran was the example. Okay, well, if, there, if a market is sanctioned by the EU or the UN, then we are unable to fund it. There are other markets that um, we deem as high risk markets where in uh, the uh, commercial underwriting space, they only recommend letters of credit. If it's a letter of credit market and we can't be persuading our underwriters to change that, then unfortunately there will be a raft of markets we can't fund. But quite often within those markets, the customers that we're asked to look at for our clients are major multinationals. And that puts a slightly different slant on it because if you're being asked to look at a, a, a shell or, or a BP, for example, in an African nation that usually might be considered too high a risk, but because it's a multinational business, it gives more comfort to the underwriters. And in those circumstances that we would endeavor to provide funding um, to, to those uh, multinational well-rated uh, companies, even if they are in very difficult markets. I'm not saying that we can do it every time, but we certainly um, see every case and take it on its own merit and try to cover as much as possible. 
Fantastic. Well, I think on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. I think we've run out of questions. So thank you once again to Yvonne for the presentation and answers and to Bibi again for the continued support on the webinar programme. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. It's now the autumn and as ever, we've got plenty going on over the, ne over the next couple of months. There's the Queen's Award for Enterprise, a prestigious annual award for UK business, which could see your business gain worldwide recognition and be invited to a fabulous royal reception in the summer. The deadline to enter that is September 12th. We then have the Institute of Export and International Trade taking its World Trade Summit programme to both Liverpool and Coventry in September and November. Indeed, uh, Bibi will again be with us in Liverpool, so um, you can meet them as well as other very good experts and trade professionals. Um, the, to, to register to those, you need to go to export.org.uk forward slash events. We're taking a short break on the webinar front for a month or so now, but we will be back in October for our annual food and drink session with the UK Food and Drink Exporters Association. This year, we're looking at how to do research export markets in a pragmatic and time effective way. And though this will have a sector slant to it, there should be plenty of decent advice for companies from any sector. So please do register for that one. It's on October 16th, and you can find sign up details for that and all of our webinars at opensexport.com forward slash webinars. Finally, as always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's webinar and to give any suggestions for improvements or future topics. But for now, goodbye.